Hi, everybody, and welcome to the third Myeloma Crowd Roundtable of 2021. This is our 16th webcast since the start of the pandemic. Today's program covers a very important issue for myeloma patients. What should we do if we relapse or we become refractory, meaning resistant, to certain treatments? Uh, patients in this situation always ask, what is next? Um, and I've heard a lot of this from a lot of close friends recently. So this is an important topic that we wanted to cover. With all the advances in myeloma treatment in the past decades and in the near future, uh, the answer for many of us about what's next is there's a lot coming. We have a fantastic lineup of myeloma experts with us today to discuss various scenarios and we'll end the program with a 45 minute Q&A session. So Dr. Noah Brand is Associate Professor in the Myeloma Division of the John Thur Cancer Center at Hackensack University Medical Center in New Jersey. She's very active and involved in clinical research with a focus on high-risk disease and the role of minimal residual disease in multiple myeloma. Dr. William Matsui is Deputy Director of the Live Strong Cancer Institutes at the Dell Medical School at the University of Texas at Austin and has built a myeloma program from scratch. He hosted our next to last live meeting in Austin in November, 2019. And we look forward to going back to Austin as soon as COVID allows. Um, we may have with us Dr. Kenneth Shane, who is a myeloma specialist at the H. Lee Moffitt Cancer Center and Research Institute in Tampa, Florida. He's very active in conducting clinical trials and research in drug response, drug combinations, and personalized disease management. And to learn more about our speakers, short biographies of the faculty with an agenda were sent to you by email from our roundtable program director, Greg Brosite. Now, if you have questions to submit, please use the Q&A link at the bottom of your screen. And before we get started, I do want to thank our generous sponsors, Amgen Oncology, Adaptive Biotechnologies, Bristol-Myers Squibb, Genentech, GSK, Janssen Oncology, Cariofarm, Oncopeptides, and Takeda Oncology, because without them, we could not provide this valuable, informative program for you throughout the world. So now for the next 45 minutes, we'll discuss various scenarios to find out what each of our speakers has experienced, what they would recommend, and how these strategies may change in the future. I'll direct a question to one of our speakers, but I'd invite them all to join in and discuss them together. So um, let's get started. So if you want to, I think we're all online, right? Um, so Dr. Brand, myeloma patients who achieve remissions in their first lines of therapy are told they'll likely relapse, but hopefully after a long time, but sometimes it can be short. So how do you approach treating a person who gets a long remission before relapse as opposed to one who achieves a short one or not one at all. And maybe you can start by explaining what a line of therapy means for our audience. And maybe to just clarify relapse versus refractory because that's a very common question. All right. Yay. And thank you for inviting me to this um, very, very interesting and useful uh, discussion um, regarding relapse refractory myeloma. As you all know, the field is changing very rapidly and it's very important that patients stay up to date on what all the options are. Um, and it, you know, not only does it give you hope and um, you know, perspective on what's moving on uh, in the future, but it's, you know, it's always good to bring these, these treatments and options up with your own physicians. Um, so what is a line of therapy? First of all, a line of therapy is defined as a change in treatment based on progression of disease. So for example, if you are on a combination of bortezomib, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone, for example, and you develop peripheral neuropathy or any other side effect from a, from a treatment, and the treatment is changed, that does not constitute a second line of therapy. You have to meet criteria for progression of disease. And that criteria is very strictly defined by IMWG. So we as physicians are always looking for specific cutoffs as what defines progression of disease. A small increase in the free light chains or a small increase in the M-spike may not necessarily define disease progression. An M-spike has to go up, for example, if you're an M-spike myeloma person, not everybody makes M-spike, but if you are, then the M-spike would have to go up by 0.5 grams per deciliter from the nadir. And the nadir is the lowest value. 
So once you hit that definition and you change therapy, that is, con that is considered a new line of therapy. So some people, they get induction, you know, four or six cycles of induction, a transplant, maintenance, and consolidation, all of that is still one line. And then they progress. Then you're on second line. So all of that treatment is still considered first line therapy. So that's the first thing. Now, the question is, how do we identify who is going to have a long remission and who's going to have a short remission? We have ways to predict this, and that's based on your initial bone marrow tests. And we have different ways of risk stratification. We have the staging system. So we have Dury Salmon, we have international staging system, and we have revised international staging system. So if you're a stage one, you're probably going to have a longer remission. If you're a stage three, you may have a shorter remission. But now we go beyond just burden of disease. We go into more of genetics. And we, there are certain mutations that we can identify uh, using tests such as FISH, fluorescent in situ hybridization, or cytogenetics which looks at the chromosomes of the cancer cells as a whole. And we also have more advanced testing now looking at whole, um, gene expression profiling. We can sequence the RNA and the DNA of the cancer cells to identify certain mutations that may predict a shorter or a longer remission. Now, with all of these wonderful tests, it's not always perfect. There are patients who we predict a very long remission and they have a shorter remission and vice versa. And for people who don't always meet that definition and they relapse very quickly after transplant. And what I mean by that is with, with maintenance, uh, probably you know less than two and a half or three years, that's considered a quick remission. Without maintenance, 18 months, less than 18 months would be considered a short remission. Um, for those people who relapse earlier than expected, we consider those patients to be functionally high risk. And that, you know, that carries a different prognosis and we should really approach those patients in a very different way. And so we have a myriad of treatments for first relapse or second line. The first time you relapse is called second line therapy. And you can choose from a whole host of treatments. The disease tends to be sensitive to almost everything at that point in time. So if it's a slow relapse where your M spike is creeping slowly, slowly, month by month, you may choose uh, a less aggressive treatment. And if you're relapsing very quickly with symptoms, with bone pain, with kidney failure, with severe anemia, you may pick a more aggressive treatment for that first treatment or that first relapse therapy. Um, in general, you can use what you had in the beginning. It's reasonable to use what you had for induction therapy to repeat it. It will most likely still work. But I think for the most part, um, most physicians are picking either uh, a daratumumab-based regimen. Daratumumab is a monoclonal antibody to CD38. And it's a very good drug for first relapse because um, A, it's very well tolerated and B, it's very effective. And um, now, especially with subcutaneous injection, it makes it very tolerable because remember, once you relapse after transplant, you're on therapy chronically for the most part. There's exceptions to that. So the treatment has to be based on both efficacy, but also long-term tolerability. It has to be something that you're not going to have side effects or significant side effects. And that's going to be convenient. You don't want to be, you know, coming every week for the rest of your life, getting stuck um, if, if there's an alternative option. And the first relapse tends to have the longest duration. So you're, so the best ideal scenario is to use the best drugs first that are gonna give you the deepest remission, get your disease as low as it can go, and something that you'll be able to tolerate. And that's why a combination using daratumumab is, a very, is, is often my preferred first line therapy. Um, I think most physicians uh, that treat myeloma tend to agree with this.
but um, that tends to be my go-to. And you can use it in combination. Remember, nothing works by itself in myeloma, unfortunately. You have to mostly use triplet therapy. So we usually use daratumumab with either an imid, so lenalidomide or pomalidomide, or you can use it with a proteasome inhibitor such as bortezomib, carfilzomib, sometimes even ixazomib is a good partner. Um, so it depends on the person, what side effects you're trying to avoid. Somebody has already numbness, tingling, you may not want to use one of those drugs that causes that. Someone has heart issues, you may not want to cause something that can exacerbate heart issues. If somebody um, has stomach problems, you know, you may want to avoid certain medications. But in general, for first relapse, um, it is advised to use daratumumab with a partner. Um, you can sometimes use all oral regimens. There are all oral regimens that are very effective in the first relapse. Um, those, you know, perhaps ixazomib with an imid. Um, you can use, um, sometimes it's appropriate to use only two drugs like pomalidomide and dexamethasone in certain situations. Um, but it really depends on the rate of relapse how many symptoms, what are the symptoms, how quickly do you need to achieve a remission, and the person and their situation, how, you know, how well can they come to and from your office is, is a big consideration. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. There's a lot to consider. Dr. Matsui, do you have any thoughts about this early versus later relapse? And Dr. Brown? Yeah, so I think that, you know, that is, I think, changed a little bit over time because of two things. One is, is that we have a really a wider range of things to treat patients with relapse disease with. And I think that in the past, you know, if you had, um, if you had patients who were relapsing quite early, I think it was very difficult to um, switch to something else and expect that that was going to give you, you know, something like a longer period of time than the first round. So, you know, what was said about like your it tends to be that your, your first remission is your longest remission, I think still holds true. I think that, you know, if you think about it and, um, you know, the armamentarium of, of agents for myeloma has expanded so much, it's kind of like trying to find, you know, the right key for the right lock. So it may be that the first time you try a key, it doesn't work, right? But it may be that if you go on to something else, that is somewhat different, let's say, instead of being, um, you have, instead of being a proteasome-based uh, strategy, now you're using, uh, you know, a monoclonal antibody-based strategy. I think that, that, you know, there are times when you're quite surprised where whatever happened the first time around is not predictive what, what's going to happen the second time around. So I think that, you know, being open to um, all options and thinking about um, in early cases, sort of what is the way you can sort of alter the therapy the most, right? So and sort of change the mechanism, I think to me is kind of the crux of trying to find some, finding the key that works. I think that in patients who have, have long relapses and especially those, like you sort of know the devil you know. So if you underwent a therapy and you know what the side effects of that therapy were, you know how often you have to come into the office, you know what the monitoring is, what to look out for, and you, you were, have sort of spent a lot of time away from that therapy. So a good example is if you're on RVD and then you go on to a transplant and then maybe you go on to maintenance or maybe not, and you relapse it at a very remote time. I think that that is always a possibility to go back to because psychologically, you kind of know <laughs> what happened. And I think that that provides some sense of control over, okay, like I, I know what that was like. I can remember what it was like. It wasn't too bad. You know, that might be an option. So I think I, I like to think about late relapsers in terms of maybe you can go back to the same mechanism of action because it worked well. So maybe it'll work well again. If you have something that didn't work so well in an early relapser, then I would say, look, let's move on to something else that is all is different. And I think that as we move on over the next year or two, I think they're going to be 
the, the, the benefit is, is not just more myeloma agents. The benefit's gonna be that there are different mechanisms by which these things work. And that I think is really the way to flesh out the armamentarium of things that we have. But, um, you know, it is, if someone has, was on something and they had a horrible experience with it, even though it worked well, you might have pause and say, look, why don't we alter it this way or that way? But so I think that I, I view it, like I said, in the context of what they had before and sort of how big a switch do you need to, to have and why are you making that switch? You know, is it because of, of efficacy or is it because of the patient liked it or not? Patient, some patients are very much tied to what they were initially on, like surprisingly. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, I didn't like this or this or whatever. And you say, okay, well, let's switch to the other thing. And they say, no, I actually want to stay on what I was on no, before. Like and, like <laughs> yeah. and, and so I, I think that that yeah. is, there are, are situations where that is very much a possibility. And I like, I like it that the patients are coming from a place where they have experience and expertise. They have more expertise getting that chemotherapy than I do because I've never had it. And so mm -hmm. I, I really like that part about late relapsers. You can be somewhat creative in that way. Mm -hmm. And I want to come back to this class changing idea, but Dr. Brand, you mentioned using daratumumab now, like either up front in therapies or at first relapse. And um, I always hear that suggested, but we have another monoclonal antibody isotuximab. So like, when do you consider using daratumumab or isotuximab or how do you, how do you think about that as myeloma specialist? It's challenging um, to find really, uh, you know, a difference. There isn't really a difference in terms of, we don't know that if one is better than the other, they work by the same mechanism. Um, there is single agent activity, meaning isotuximab did, did show a little bit better, maybe single agent activity compared to daratumumab, but you can't really say that because it wasn't compared head to head. So you really, that's really not any proven thing. Um, the, you know, the reason to, that I personally use DARA is because it, it eventually becomes once a month, whereas isatuximab does not. It stays every other week. So it's really a convenience issue. I don't have any proof that ISA is better in that role. Now, the other thing that is going to be looked at is, is there a role for isatuximab in patients who have failed daratumumab? So can it overcome resistance to daratumumab with other combinations? So, you know, perhaps um, there will be a role in that setting. I also think it's important at all lines of therapy, at every relapse, to consider clinical trials. And I tell this to all my patients because, you know, with all of these therapies, most myeloma patients end up getting everything at some point or another. You will get Selenex or you will get Belantamab, you will get, you know, all of the drugs in some way, shape, or form, unless you're intolerant. And so it's good to have other options and clinical trials present you with other options. And even if you say, well, why should I go on a trial? I, I haven't used all the therapies. Well, the reason is because you may not be eligible for a clinical trial later. To go on a trial, you have to have good hemoglobin, good kidney function. You can't be progressing rapidly. You have to, you know, so if you're eligible now for a clinical trial, go on it because it may work. It may give you years of remission. You know, you never know. That's how pomalidomide came. That's how carfilzomib came. All of the drugs we use today came from a clinical trial and patients had access to it who were on that trial before others. So you can always save the FDA approved treatments for later but you can't always go on a clinical trial. So if you, you go on a clinical trial and it works great, if it doesn't work, you come off and you go on, a, on regular FDA approved therapy. So I think it's important to consider even at early relapses. Yeah, I agree. And I wanna talk about that a lot later because okay. especially when immunotherapies are kind of jumping into the mix, like I, I really want you to talk about that. Um, so Dr. Matsui, you talked about this before, but I want to I want you both to talk about um, drugs class changes. So like in normal oncology, if you fail a drug class, you don't really reuse that drug class. And what you were saying earlier, Dr. Matsui, is that you are actually reusing even the same drugs in the same class. Mm 
But do you want to talk about, first explain relapse versus refractory, because sometimes patients get confused about what that means. And then um, becoming refractory is kind of scary. So can you give us some strategies? So if somebody becomes refractory to a class of a backbone therapy, like a proteasome inhibitor or like an IMID, what do you do next? And then open it up to both of you. Yeah, so I think that, you know, in terms of thinking about uh, mechanisms of, of action, I tend to think about the drugs as sort of members of a family, right? So if you have a mechanism like, I, you know, a, a sort of one that I think is easy to understand is like lenalidomide. So lenalidomide has other two other drugs that are associated with it that, you know, we think work very similarly. Um, one is palmolist and then the other one is thalidomide. So you know, you can think about that as a family. And so I think that the question is, is that do you think about families as sort of mutually exclusive, right? Or do you think about families as, you know, that the members are mutually exclusive? So I think that in terms of mechanisms of action, that's where I think I tend to think of things in groups. So all of the amides by themselves or all of the proteasome inhibitors, maybe monoclonals. And so Thinking about them that way, you know, it may not make the most sense where if you were on a proteasome inhibitor and that failed to control your myeloma, to go on to another proteasome inhibitor may not make a whole lot of sense. I think that there are a couple things in that that I think are nuances. One is, is that, you know, back in the day, we only had IMIDs and we only had proteasome inhibitors. Like that's what we had for a long amount of time. And we had multiple drugs in those two families. And so we didn't really have the luxury of moving to another class of agent because there were no other families to really pull from. And so we do have a lot of experience. You know, if you're, if you've got, you know, if you, if you go back and you've treated patients for a ton of time, you, you know, you were stuck with these tools and you mixed and matched them and you, you did your best, right? And oftentimes you would, you could get things to work even if they didn't work before. So I think in terms of thinking about, me when people talk about mechanisms action, just think about the multiple drugs that sort of have the same, are in the same sort of family, like image or proteasome. I think that the other, the other question is, is that, well, if you have these, um, you know, these classes, should you, you know, would it be better to say, you know, let's say you had someone who relapsed very late. And so you had the opportunity of saying, look, I think that that family of drugs works well, but now should I switch the family? And I think that that's really a personal decision. I think that most often than not, it's easiest for us to imagine that, well, you know, maybe switching to something new, but not completely new in the mechanism of action, switching to a new drug in that family maybe gives a little bit more of an advantage. So if you think about it, even though drugs can be in the same family, they are not all exactly the same or else we wouldn't have like, <laughs> three, you know, three proteasome inhibitors and three amides, there, there are differences. And so I think that going from one to another within a family is still okay um, as long as, you know, I think that there's not really like this, this true refractory disease um, where, you know, one, if one class, if, if an age, if, if a combination really does not work, then I'm, I'm hesitant to like switch all of those drugs just to different members of the same families. I, I, and I think that in my Loma now, we have the luxury of actually switching to other families, mm -hmm. right? Like before we were painted in the corner because we didn't have those options. So I think that that in, in terms of thinking about um, switching classes versus switching agents, I think both of those have a place, but it really is so personalized that I think that that, that choice is challenging sometimes. Um, I think that, you know, one of the things to remember is, is that, you know, the question is, well, why do we use these things in combination? Like, why don't we just use one after another, after another, after another? And, you know, it, they work better when you combine them together. So not only is, is it a drug that is working or one drug or another drug that's working, there's something magical about the combination oftentimes that, 
works in a, what, a, what we call a synergistic way. So it's more than just adding the efficacy of the two together. And so sort of like, if you have like, you know, me as a doctor and I'm the only person you see ever, right? That is not as good as if I, you see me along with a team of other people who are gonna help take care of you, right? So it's a, it's a big difference. So I think that working, having you know, individuals work together creates synergy in terms of taking care of patients. Just like drugs, when they work together, you can create things that by themselves, you're never gonna see. So I, you can still use agents, even though the patient's relapsing, because it may be that the combination switch is actually good as well. So I think there are a lot of different ways to do it. And I think it really is dependent upon having like a really frank conversation with your oncologist about, I think it's always fair. Like what I always like is when patients say, well, why are you doing that? Like, why are you recommending that? Because yeah. I think our job is to explain to people, look, these are the options. And this is the way I think about your case, because that I think is critical that we're all on the same page. And if you agree with my thinking, let's go for it. If you don't agree with my thinking, let's talk about it because I want you to be on the same page as I am. Um, as far as refractory disease goes, it's really, you know, uh, a, um, a difference between relapse and refractory is really, if you're getting agents, if you're getting treated and that just is not working and has no initial effect, right? So if you, let's say, have someone they're newly diagnosed, you give them a combination of medic med medications and there's no real appreciable improvement in their M spike and their light chains, that would be refractory disease. And that warrants, you know, I, I think a change in all the, all the classes if you can. I think that if you have someone who's relapsed, obviously they've had a period of time where they've had some sort of response or remission, and then the disease will come back. And I think that the way in which it comes back and sort of, you know, when do you sort of say, okay, you, you, we have these official designations of like you relapse if your M spike increases by this percentage, by this much. I think that that is really great for clinical trials because we have to, we have to standardize patients and understand who we're studying. But I think that in real life, there are some subtleties to that. And, um, you know, I think that's something that we'll probably talk about later. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Dr. Brand, do you have any comments about that, that topic? Oh, you're muted. Sorry about that. I was answering some Zoom questions. Um, so I think in general, um, we're left, you know, in general, the idea is you use triplets. If somebody is relapsing, you have the option of changing one class or changing two classes. And uh, I agree with Dr. Matsui. It depends on the patient. I think if it's a depends on what they've tolerated in the past. If it's uh, if they've been on something for a very long time, for example, I have patients on 100 cycles of Revdex. When they relapse, they're getting two new two new drugs. I mean, because you you know, to me, you're more likely to respond um, to two new ones. Um, you know, compared to just changing one. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to take that risk um, because you can always dial back. It's much more challenging to, if somebody doesn't respond to something, to achieve a remission when you add a third. It's always better to, to in, in my experience, to change two agents and then you can always take back if you need. Um, if somebody is just having a slow, biochemical relapse, meaning the numbers are slowly creeping up, but they're not having symptoms, then it's reasonable to just change one drug in the class. Um, but I think if there's any aggressive relapse or if there is any um, relapse after being on treatment for a prolonged period of time, you're better ch changing two classes of drugs, um, especially when we have all of these treatments. And you know, nobody knows the answer to this. Is it, is it sequencing? What's the best sequence? What's the best order to use drugs? We don't know. Nobody's looked at this. But we do know that um, when you use a good regimen, uh, you achieve a, a deeper remission. When you use a very potent, effective regimen in the beginning, you can kind of get at the multiple clones of the myeloma because myeloma isn't just one cell. They've looked right. at right. these tumors in people and, you know, they've looked at a bone lesion in the clavicle and a bone lesion in the hip. They're two different 
they look different. Those cells Gen are genetically, different. you're saying genetically, right? exactly. Right. Even one person, and that goes more for the argument of using, you know, two new classes uh, with each relapse. And it's also a good idea to restage, you know, to get another bone marrow at, at each relapse, and to see what new genetic mutations have have developed. Um, you know, now we we do have some therapies that can. Um, that are personalized, for example, T1114 mutation. Um, there's a therapy called venetoclax that's very, very effective in people who have either BCL2 upregulation or T1114, which is a translocation. Um, it's not an FDA approved treatment yet for myeloma, but it is, we can get it. Um, we, we are able to get it for those patients who have those mutations. So it's helpful to, to restage and re-risk stratify at each relapse. I agree. And um, Dr. Matsu, we're going to talk about like, you know, new kind of MRD type testing, but what you're talking about, Dr. Brent, is really important. Like you should be identified, you should know your enemy at diagnosis when you have disease that's testable. So once you start treatment, there's no more myeloma cells to test. And you might want to get that done, that diagnostic testing, genomic diagnostic testing done at diagnosis, but you're saying at each relapse because myeloma does evolve over time, right? Absolutely. So, yeah. And you need to know your enemy to know how you're going to approach that. That's my doctor's analogy all the time. Yeah. Okay. So Dr. Matsui, um, we do have these new tools like next generation sequencing. And I mean, everyone should be doing the fish test at, at, at a minimum, but, um, and you mentioned, Dr. Brand, the biochemical um, relapse versus the clinical relapse. Dr. Matsui, do you want to explain the difference between those two types of relapse and then how you approach both of those? And then Dr. Brand will want you to weigh in on that also. Yeah. So I think that, you know, there are when, when you know, one, one thing to imagine is like when people are initially diagnosed, sometimes they're diagnosed because they find a monoclonal spike and you see you know, light chain elevations. And the question is, is that, is that actual myeloma or is that, or is that sort of some precursor condition like smoldering myeloma? And really the difference there is whether or not that um, process is causing any um, bodily damage. So is there any end organ damage? And that could be kidney problems. That could be problems like anemia. So, you know, that distinction is important because there are some parameters by which we, even the patient's not symptomatic, there's no end organ damage, we might go ahead and start treating that person like a myeloma patient. But in most instances, we would say, look, there's no evidence of damage here. And so what we're going to do is we're going to wait, right? Mm -hmm. Even though you clearly right. see that yeah. there's something there. So when patients relapse, it's a very analogous situation. So you could say, look, I see something coming back. So obviously there's something on the horizon. And the question is, is that, is that, uh, relapse now actually doing damage to the patient, right? So if you're really just getting your, you know, your blood tests, you're looking at the results and you're seeing your numbers change, that I think is, you know, in the very, very early stages, if you have a negative M spike and now it becomes positive and it's, you know, not high, but it's trace positive or your light chains start to go up, that is really what I like to call biochemical relapse. Because a patient then, when you look at them, is almost never in renal failure, never has, you know, you know, we should check for bone disease whenever anyone's numbers are going up, but you know, probably doesn't have anemia at that point. So there's not really end organ damage. So one question is, is that should we um, treat patients right when we see something changing, or should we wait for signs that they're, you know, you don't want anyone to get into any problems with end organ damage, but can you sort of wait and figure out um, when the right time to go is? Because maybe there's an interval of time that you want to you know, keep on doing what you're doing. And especially if people are not on treatment, that might be, you know, it, it's hard to have side effects from just waiting. So I think that that distinction is important because people have for a long time tried to figure out, well, do you, what do you gain by treating early, right? So what do you gain before something happens? And so there, I think the argument has been made that if you treat early, then what you're doing is you're really preventing the possibility of 
generating an organ disease, right? So there have been a couple of studies that have looked at treating patients. These are within the context of other clinical trials, but treating patients when you have biochemical relapse versus you have clinical relapse. And what you can find universally is that if you treat patients with biochemical relapse, it takes them a longer time before they truly progress, right, for their next round. And so you could say, well, that's good because we're staving things off and we're you know, preventing all these bad things from happening. Or you could sort of view it in another way where you say, well, obviously we're, we're, they're going longer because from the start of treatment because we're starting treatment earlier. Right? So we're treating them for a longer period of time, it may be like six months before you treat them the next time. So I think that though it's, it's, it's difficult to sort of understand, um, you know, just in a very broad level, what, what should we do with biochemical relapse? Because it's truly anxiety provoking, right? Yeah, because you sort is. of say, look, I was negative and now I'm positive. And so, oh yeah, my God, yeah. this is really bad. Right. <laughs> so I think that it is. It is. And so yeah. I think that part of it is, 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 maybe looking back a little bit on what has gone on before. So if someone had a very aggressive presentation or very aggressive disease, and I would say, look, if I see something early, I don't wanna play chicken with this. I think that I should start treating now because I'm afraid that I'm gonna, you know, by waiting, I'm gonna run into problems. If someone had a very like, you know, if you have someone who had, let's say smoldering myeloma for, 15 years and then developed myeloma, and then you treated it and it went completely away very, very quickly and the patient is fine, I would say, look, having the M spike come back, right? I would sort of, let's just watch it if you feel comfortable with that. Like it, uh, the number one thing is you feel comfortable with that. And for me, it's, it's sort of like, you know, people say, well, you know, it's back now. And I say, well, if you think about it, you had a spike for like however many years and we didn't do anything then and you were totally fine. So I think you can't, I think looking back into sort of what the tenor of the disease is, I think it's harder when you go through, each line you go through, it tends to be a shorter amount of time that you're in remission and it tends to be a faster rate of relapse when you do relapse. So I think that the later you go on, I think biochemical relapse becomes much more important. I think that in the early days, uh, like first or second relapse, I think you have to think a little bit about where the patient is at, right? Because it may be that you play it a little bit slower. If the rise is gonna be slow, then I would say, look, I think you have time to kind of think about it, right? Think about, get some data. Like I think I would, instead of checking people's blood work every three months, I would check them every month. Right. Let's just see. Let's just watch and see where things are going. So, the I think that that it depend. Like I said, it depends on the situation. Most of the time, when people have looked at biochemical relapse and clinical relapse and shown that yeah, you have a longer progression-free survival with biochemical relapse, those are almost universally done in patients who are pretty advanced. So the situation is a little bit different in earlier stages of disease. Um, so that's. Like I said, like like for me, and I know this is totally annoying, but for me, it's like, well, every patient is different. Like if if every patient was the same, there'd be no need for myeloma experts. <laughs> like you just plug it into your computer and tell spits out, tell you what to do. But I yeah. think that it's really like trying to for us to digest all the information about what have people been on, what are their cytogenetics. You know, what, how did they tolerate the previous treatments? What are the potential options now? All of those things, you know, if you dig into someone's brain and say, well, why this or this or this or this, most myeloma specialists will have a opinion about X, Y, or Z. So I think that, that it's important to, um, you know, it's important just to know the patient much more than I got this and this, and then I relapse. So what should I do? I say, yeah. oh. I could do 50 things, and but it just depends on you specifically. So for me, that I think is the reason why I like taking care of my loan, but there is somewhat of, you got to be a good listener and you got to be a good historian, right? And then at the same time, you got to be very forward thinking about, okay, well, what's new? What are the data and what might be coming down the line? So I think it's it's one of the more challenging things that we do in oncology, but that's why I really love myeloma is because you have just such a myriad of ways of approaching it. And it's really like working with the patient because 
If it was as easy as just saying, you've relapsed, this is the, the only thing we can do, that's pretty easy. But if it's really sitting down with patients and like, you know, it may, for me, it may take like two or three visits to figure out what to do next. Because, it, you know, if you have that luxury of time, if you have a very slow relapsing patient, we want to make a good choice. We don't want to make a hasty choice that, that causes problems. Yeah, I agree. This is an art and science and we need you as myeloma experts. So I always suggest myeloma patients get a consult, especially when they're making a treatment decision, because I've experienced that too. Like, yes, relapse, but mine has been very slow. And, you know, you feel that panic, like, well, do we do something now? Well, do we do something now? Okay. Is it time yet? And then the doctor's like, yeah, okay. And it's, you know, it's time now. And then I'm, you know, you, you kind of feel like, well, we waited this long. Well, why not longer? <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. So it's this give and take back and forth and, um, and we need you as my Loma specialist. Okay. We have two questions to get through in just a couple of minutes Damn. before we open it up to Q and A, but they're really big, important questions. Um, so I will open this up first to Dr. Brown, but I want you both to jump in because it's a very complicated topic. So the first question is we have all these new tools, right? We have Selenexor, we have Melflufin now that's just been approved. We have Blenrep, we have uh, the monoclonal antibodies. When you think about using these in the clinic, how do you come to terms with that? I have friends who said, okay, I did the transplant and relapsed after that, done all the proteasome inhibitors and the image. So like, what's my next chance? If I don't have 1114, which is more obvious, right? Just, you should think about using venetoclax. Which one do I pick? Do I, you know, which one? I, it's tough. How do you pick? I mean, you have to go back to the literature and you have to look at, first of all, these drugs were approved and they all start a single agent because that's how you know that they're safe and effective. And, you know, beyond DARA and carfilzomib um, based therapies, beyond that, everything else has similar efficacy. Okay. And, and that efficacy in the third relapse and beyond is about 30% with, with whatever it is you choose. You can choose you know, Selenex or Bortezomib Dex. You can choose Panabinostat Lenalidomide Dex. You can choose Belantamab Dex. You can try Melflufen. Uh, it's intravenous every three weeks. Um, you know, they're all very, very similar. There are certain um, areas where one, you may choose one over the other. For example, uh, the Melflufen data did show some benefit in extramedullary disease. So in patients who have soft tissue tumors growing, um, you might choose that. Um, you know, in someone who has, in a young person, um, you may not want to choose Belantamab right away because, you know, a lot of the CAR T cell therapies, which are BCMA right now, most of the CAR T cells target BCMA, which is the same protein that Belantamab targets. So you may not want to exclude yourself from a CAR T cell study by taking Belantamab. Um, you know, again, there are going to be other CAR T cell studies that a don't exclude BCMA um, prior BCMA therapy and that use different targets, such as you know, there's SLAM F7 CAR T cells, there's CD19 CAR T cells. There's allogeneic off-the-shelf CAR T cells. So, you know, it's not necessarily going to exclude you from CAR T cells, but it's just something to think about, you know, waiting on that drug. Um, you know, Selenex or I think is now a very good drug to use, you know, in, in uh, second or third relapse in combination with almost anything. There's MCCN guidelines now um, have Selenex or with everything. Um, and it, you know, once you get that anti-nausea regimen, uh, you know, under control because the main side effect of Selenex or can be nausea, uh, low platelets and low sodium levels. But once as a physician, you feel comfortable managing those side effects and you have a regimen that you give, you know, a, a protocol, um, you know, it's very, it's a very effective drug when you combine it with other agents. So, um, you know, also we have to remember transplant, salvage transplant is a very good option. It, you know, it works. Um, 
If you use it after, if you have a very long remission from your first auto transplant, you can do a salvage transplant and get 40 to 50% of that remission time, maybe even more if you use some consolidation immunotherapy afterwards. Um, so there's a lot of tools in the toolbox. I think after first and second relapse, all of those agents tend to have similar response rates and it's about toxicity and strategy in terms of, you know, when are you going to do what? What clinical trials are you trying to shoot for? What's your, I always tell patients, we need a short-term plan and we need a long-term plan. So let's, you know, it's a chess game. You have to figure it out um, and you have to plan your next line of therapy with your long-term plan in mind. You know, are we using this treatment as a bridge until we get you on that trial? Are we, um, you know, going to transplant you to debulk the disease and then plan to go on Selenex or after that? So, um, yeah. yeah. It's complicated. And Dr. Matsui, I want to, I want your thoughts on it, but we're running out of time. So I might just ask you this next question in context of this topic, because what you're talking about, Dr. Brand, is a lot of um, clinical trials. So out of ASH, I just heard people, you just have this feeling that everybody wants to move all these immunotherapies up closer to frontline or first relapse, or, you know, what if we did these things first and then we go back to the other tools? So when you're thinking about clinical trial participation, do how do you think about that? Like the, I was going to say those exact same words. I wrote them down in my notes that it is a chess game, but it's it's one with our lives. And so we have to be very careful about what we end up choosing, because like what you're saying, it can preclude something that we do in the future. And and we have to be very careful about what we choose and when. So, um, Dr. Matsui, do you want to talk about clinical trials in that context? Um, and then Dr. Brand will um, welcome your thoughts on that too. And then we'll move to quickly to Q and A because yeah. So I, you know, I think that I, so I think that clinical trials are such an important part of what we do, and I, and and it's really part of it is that um, you know we didn't get to the place where we actually have all these drugs without clinical trials, right? And so it's an important thing, and I think that a lot of patients realize and understand that, you know, going on to a clinical trial is really contributing to hopefully not only your success, but the success of other myeloma patients down the line. And so I think that if there are clinical trials available, those will be almost always the first time, to, the first things I talk about. And at the same time, I'll say, look, this is one of a bunch of different options, right? Mm -hmm. But I will, I encourage people to go on clinical trials because I think that they are such a critical component of actually in the end, figuring out how to like manage the disease well, hopefully cure the disease. It's not gonna happen, just someone making it up. So mm -hmm. I, think that, I think that that's an important part of it. I think that in terms of um, strategizing about, let's say something like immunotherapy, you know, it, um, it is, uh, I don't want to sound like a Debbie Downer here, but like I think it's just important to sort of look at everything within the context. So I think that there's a lot of excitement about, about CAR T cell therapy. There's no evidence at this point that CAR T cell therapy is curative. There are people who run around saying that it's probably curative. Most of those people are the people who said that autologous stem cell transplant was curative at some point. And so I think you just gotta wait and you got to allow people, I think you have to provide the right context. So mm -hmm. you could say, look, we hope that these things are curative, but we don't have any evidence that that's the case, mm -hmm. right? Like, I think that's a fair statement, but I think right. to go around saying, look, this is, I think, going to be a curative thing. I think that's a very different way of saying it. Yeah. So yeah. I think you have to be quite honest with the patients and, um, and they're smart. So they know. And, um, but in terms of like providing immunotherapy, I think that immunotherapy has the potential of curing people at some point. Like I think that the way we're doing it now, probably not. Mm -hmm. I think that there are ways to sort of think about it that that might become um, you know, an active issue. But I think that if it's, a, if it's something where you feel like, yeah, this is really gonna has some advantage over what we're doing right now of the other options, 
Like, especially if someone is quickly progressing, relapsing between you know, multiple lines, giving them more of the same stuff is probably not the right thing to do. And so here is sort of like the question of class switching. And I mm -hmm. think that that is clinical trials are a major part of that because many of the mechanisms of action that are available are only available through clinical trials. Mm -hmm. So that's another sort of benefit. But um, I think strategizing wise, a lot of it depends on what is your access and portfolio of clinical trials at any one time, right? And so I think that it's important at, at um, you know, not only at your institution, but knowing what's going on, like in Austin, we have like three sort of providers that do myeloma and we all know what the other person's trials are. And I will send someone somewhere else if I think a trial is good. Mm -hmm. um, I'll do that in two seconds. So um, I think it's knowing sort of what the landscape is um, and trying to fit the patients into that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'd like to jump into Q and A, but before I do that, I just want to make a comment um, because this, well, the the whole pandemic really opened up new opportunities for us to support patients. We now have a relapse refractory chapter, and we'll be discussing um, topics that are just specific to relapse refractory patients. So you can find that on mylomacrowd.org under the events tab, and you can join that chapter. Um, we also have a cell and XOR support group chapter. We'll soon to have a blend rep chapter just because those two have unique side effects. And um, we will be opening up also a genomics study on Monday because we wanna see like, you know, when you said people hadn't, hadn't looked at all the data yet with like what treatment combinations are working best for which type of genetics uh, we're just going to look at the real world data that's in health tree. How are these patients with certain genetic features getting treated today in the real world? And then who's getting the best outcomes on which therapy? So we welcome you to join those, those three things. If you, and I think, and I will say, I think that that is really the wave of the future. Like we need to have some way of, of better predicting, like, yeah. you know, as Dr. Buran was saying, everything kind of works the same after a while, but mm -hmm. There's got to be some things that work better than others. And so finding ways of actually figuring yeah. that out and giving the patients the best opportunity of having drugs work and preventing use of drugs that are never going to work, I think is the, you know, is really a major goal in the field. Yeah, I agree. Well, there's so much that's available now, then it's it's overwhelming sometimes to patients.